Requesting connection. Established. Encrypted. We're live. The show you've been asking for. Advice, technology, and community. Linux first, all others second. This is Ask Noah. Live from Multispeed Technologies, the Ask Noah show starts right now. This is the show where we came to do all the things on Linux they said couldn't be done and take your questions on how to do the same. The phone lines are open this hour to be a part of the program. It is a free call. 1-855-450-NOAH. It's 1-855-450-6624 or send an email to live at asknoahshow.com. My name is Noah July. I'm your host. Delighted to be here with you as another episode of the Ask Noah show kicks off this hour. The Snap plugin for GNOME software is being disabled in Fedora 31 in the distro's next major release. Now, this was a story that actually broke last week, believe it or not. We ran out of time to be able to cover it adequately uh, because our friend and guest of the show, Bob Carver, was in studio. And so we had a fantastic discussion about home theater and audio files and the design of the makerspace and kind of where we are. And so if you didn't catch that episode, quite honestly, those are my favorite episodes to do, even though they don't directly relate to Linux, because one, I think it gives you a little bit more insight into me as a person, because I'm not just a Linux user. There's a bunch of other things that comprise my personhood. So there's that aspect of it. But the other thing is that I think that audio in particular is one of the things that anybody can enjoy Most people do enjoy, and a lot of people don't realize how inexpensively you can get into that hobby. So if you haven't checked it out, we invite you to go over to podcast.asknoahshow.com, click on episode 137, and check out our interview with Bob Carver in studio. Red Hat's Richard Hughes announced the change that Fedora on the Fedora mailing list, citing various issues with the plugins, the QA, and the long-term usefulness. Now, Neil Gompa, who maintains the snap package in Fedora, said that the decision blindsided him. Quote from Richard, the existing Snap plugin is not very well tested, and I don't want to be the one responsible when it breaks. At the moment, enabling the Snap plugin causes the general UX of GNOME software to degrade, as all search queries are then routed through Snap D rather than being handled in the same process. I have to tell you folks, when I read this article, and when uh, this whole story broke, I was a confused panda. I'm still a confused panda. There are so many questions bouncing around in my head, I don't even know where to begin. Let's start with, why is Canonical not maintaining the Snap plugin for the default software store in the default desktop environment of their own distro? That is to say, Canonical repositioned itself to use gnome as the desktop shipping with ubuntu proper and part of the reason that we were given for that was they didn't want the uh maintainership of maintaining unity and so they wanted to let the community at large maintain the desktop environment and that's where all of the momentum was on the ask noah show which by the way launched literally days before canonical made that announcement it was one of the first things we covered on the show We applauded Canonical for their decision to choose to embrace the default desktop environment that basically most other distros have gone with. It seems to me that you're limiting the usefulness of using and leveraging the default desktop environment that's shipped with many other distros if you choose not to participate in the primary graphical way that users are to retrieve software. If they go into Fedora, they're going to open the GNOME Software Center and they're going to install their packages. Again, assuming they're using a graphical environment. If they're in Arch, they're going to open the GNOME Software Center and they're going to search for the software. Again, assuming a graphical environment. If they're on SUSE, same thing. If they're like All of these other distributions that are using GNOME as the default desktop environment If users are installing packages in a graphical way, and again, if we want to be approachable to new users on Linux, if we want to be approachable to newbies, then a graphical software installer makes a lot of sense. People are very familiar with the concept of an app store. In fact, I've, it's been very positively received when I show somebody how to install software on Linux and we're going through some variation of a software store. 
the first thing somebody says is, oh, so it's just like my iPhone. It's just like my Android. I open up the App Store and I install it from there. Mind you, we in Linux had that long before Apple had it and long before Windows had it. So we were ahead of the curve. The others are just catching up now. So a software store makes a lot of sense. And if a software store makes a lot of sense and we want to encourage new users to obtain their software through the software center, again, it solves a lot of problems because you no longer have people trying to Google to download the dev or Google to download the RPM or downloading the tarball and then, you know, uh, you know, ex you know, uh, extracting it, downloading source code and compiling it, adding, I mean, all the different various ways that we go about the process of getting software on Linux that has confused users since basically the inception of Linux. The software center tends to solve all of those issues. So it stands to reason that if you're shipping software or if you're shipping the desktop environment in GNOME, you would want the GNOME software center to work. And that's where you'd want your users to go to obtain software. Is something wrong with the GNOME software center? I have to ask, is something wrong with GNOME software center? And that's why Canonical has gone about the business of developing their own software center. And then that leads into a whole bunch of more questions like why, for example, did Canonical not work with the GNOME team to improve the existing GNOME software center? Is it something where the GNOME people said, no, we don't want your help. We like our crappy software store just fine because let's face it, any of us that are using GNOME on any distro, I don't think many of us have particularly positive things to say about the software center. I would also argue that if the software center were really that good, if the software center were good enough and to the point where I think it really should be on a major desktop operating system, most of us wouldn't keep resorting to the command line to get the software we, we want. I, I tell you what, though, even as simple as updating, I have run into to issues trying to do updates in a graphical system. I still prefer to drop down to the command line to, to run updates because every once in a while it'll say, a uh, fail doesn't have an internet connection. Yes, I have an internet connection. I was just browsing the internet. I was in the process of doing something on the internet when I realized that this thing was out of date and I needed to update, which is why I've opened the software updater. And then it doesn't update because there's a problem with the internet. So we, we don't put a lot of emphasis on fixing this stuff. And frankly, I think a lot of Linux users don't really care because we do it all from the command line. But if there's a problem, with GNOME software, let's acknowledge there's a problem instead of shoving it under the rug and recreating something new from scratch, and let's fix it. And if we can't fix it because we're being told by the people that are in the GNOME Software Foundation or the, the people that are in charge of GNOME, if they're saying we're unwilling to fix it or we're unwilling to accept patches, then that conversation needs to be brought out into the spotlight. We need to have a discussion about the, uh, the effectiveness of continuing to maintain a desktop distribution in which you have not one, but two of the largest Linux companies in the world, both simultaneously working on. And if there's some reason they're not that Canonical is writing their own software center rather than improving the GNOME software center. Then my final question, why is Red Hat making a decision about what's included in Fedora and why is the package maintainer of SnapD taken by surprise? You would think logic dictates that the package maintainer of SnapD and the Snap plugin for the software store, GNOME software store, you would think he would be the first person to go to to have a discussion and say, "Oi, does this does this make a bad for does this make for a bad experience? Do we need to reevaluate this? Is there a reason that we're including it or not including it?" Now, here's the interesting thing: Neil Gompa is a friend of mine and a follower of the Ask Noah show. And so when this article came out, I called him up and said, Neil, uh, can you uh, can you make some time? Can you sit down with us and discuss what is going on? Because frankly, I'm pretty confused by this. And as the package maintainer, I don't understand why this wasn't your decision. And he said, you know what? It's a great point. I also was kind of confused, especially because I'm the guy that sits down with Canonical employees and works actively between Fedora and Canonical to make sure that SnapD functions properly on Fedora. So he's going to join us later in the program. We're going to talk to him a little bit about this because I want to get his hot take on it. I find this to be very confusing. Quote, the design of SnapD also means that packages just get updated behind GNOME software's back. And so it's a very hard to do anything useful in the UI or to make things metered 
to make things like meter data work correctly. Um, yeah, they update on their own behind the scenes. That's kind of the point of snaps. And the reason that's kind of the point of snaps is because we have proven time and time again that we cannot rely on a user's, uh, we cannot rely on the users to properly update their own software. We can't rely on manufacturers to publish their updates in a structured way that users can receive them. And we can't necessarily always rely on distro maintainers and various flavors and all of that to, to make sure all of the pieces come together from the software manufacturers that publish their updates in a whole bunch of ways and users that don't update with any consistency. So we, that was the whole purpose. That's a whole reason, or one of the main reasons, why snaps are so beneficial. They are a hands-off approach. It just works. Going back to the article, quote, there's also no sandboxing support years after it was promised, which means on Fedora, running a snap is no more secure than running wget taco tack URL and then blah, 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 unlike flashback. Now, here is where I, I really, this article really starts to grind me the wrong way. So first of all, whose responsibility is it? Whose responsibility is it to properly implement sandboxing? on SnapD, on Fedora. Are, are we really trying to imply that that is Canonical's responsibility to implement proper sandboxing on a distro that they don't maintain? As far as I know, sandboxing works just fine on Ubuntu. So it seems to be a Fedora-specific problem. And if it's a Fedora-specific problem, who exactly would be responsible of fixing said Fedora-specific problem except the team on Fedora? And that's, the, that's I, I just, I don't even understand exactly what that comment is implying. Unless it's to say, we didn't, I, the, the way it's phrased, was years after it was promised. Promised by who? Promised by who and for whom? Because I, I, I find it, well, rather arrogant, really, to say that it's Canonical's responsibility to make a promise to implement proper sandboxing on other distributions. That very much seems like it's something that Fedora should pick up or Red Hat should pick up and it's not like they don't have the money and figure out. Again, I come back to why wasn't Neil consulted? That's the part that doesn't make, well, it's one of many parts that don't make sense to me. Also factoring into the, this is another quote, also, also factoring into the decision is word on the street, Canonical is working on its own bespoke snap only store, uh, revealing that developers currently assigned to work on GNOME software have been reassigned to work on the Snap Store. Okay, so first off, that shouldn't surprise anybody. It should surprise absolutely no one that Canonical, after spending thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars on developing a new universal package system, and then also going about the process of making sure that anybody that wants to participate in that that new packaging system can participate in that packaging system because they've reached out to various businesses. They've gone into the Microsoft's into the all the different software vendors of the world and said, hey, if you want to put your software on Linux, not only can we show you how easy that is, we will actually send our developers to sit down with your developers. You guys can all sit together and sing Kumbaya and create software that works on Linux. So if that's the, the lengths and efforts that Canonical is going to to make sure that various pieces of software are ported as snaps, I don't understand. Like, is it in Canonical's best interest for Fedora to run SnapD and to run the SnapD plugin in the GNOME Software Center? Or is that in Canonical's best interest? Canonical or Fedora? Which one? Because to me, from where I'm standing, it seems like that's a far bigger benefit to Fedora than it is to Canonical. If I'm Canonical... I could care less if you run SnapD. I could care less if you include the Snap in your in your software center. You know what that means? That means all of this work that we have invested in to get people to come into the Snap package format, it means all those people are going to be installing Ubuntu next time around because all of the software availability that's there. It is the number one thing we hear from users when you ask them why they don't use Linux on the desktop. Software, 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 software. That is the one thing that keeps people off of Linux, followed very closely by incompatible hardware. Thank God that problem is mostly solved. So there is a massive benefit in Fedora to, to implementing SnapD and the SnapD plugin into the software center. And there is a massive disadvantage to Fedora to not put in the, the work, the effort, the whatever it takes to get that to work. And I don't understand 
why it seems to be surprising that Canonical would design a Snap Store that is specifically designed around and works s exclusively with Snap packages. That seems like the very natural evolution of developing a universal package format, pushing all of your vendors and every person that will open an ear up and listen to into that platform, and then turning turn around and putting that platform as the default software system on the, the, the machine. The only thing that I don't understand about that bespoke Snap-only store why is it not part of the GNOME Software Center? That's the, that's, that's the one thing that doesn't make sense to me from Canonical's point of view. Every other part of this seems like it falls back on Red Hat. The work that Canonical has done goes above, well above and beyond Snap packages in and of themselves, right? Because they are creating, again, they're going to these businesses and they are creating relationships. They are giving demonstrations. They are showing application developers that have an Electron app. Here's the like basically single command that you need to take your Electron app and build it into a snap. All of those benefits, all of the benefits that Canonical has banked for themselves is available just by getting SnapD to work on a Fedora system. And in the case of graphical software installation, getting snap the snap plug snap the plug in to work in gnome software we have we are back at a place where we have competing universal installers and i don't think that's a good thing i think that we have really reached a point where we have too much choice and too much choice leads to tribes and loyalties to our given choices to kind of back them up and prove them and because we're all technical nerds we all have our own technical arguments of why one thing is better than the other here's what you have to understand the adobe's of the world the sony's of the world the microsoft's of the world they could care less what tribe you're in they could care less what technical advantage one thing has over the other here's what they see the thirty thousand foot view is developing and publishing to linux is a mess because if we release it as a snap all the fat flat pack people and app image people and RPM people and dead people. I saw a guy on a chat room or in a forum complaining that we should go back to just publishing source code and just have a tarball. And what was wrong with that? It worked fine for 25 years and you had a man page and you grew up the man page and then you could install the tarball. I don't understand why we just don't go back to that. Um, because it sucks. Because normal human beings don't want to download a tarball off of an FTP server, extract it, keep track of where all those files go, keep track of all the what library files and dependencies are required to make that program work, create all the shortcuts, and then if you ever have to remove this off to reverse that entire process. Like, it's a terrible system. And why that doesn't, like, why, why some people can't get that through their thick noggin is really beyond me. But out of all of the, all, all of these systems, they all have their individual benefits, right? SnapD obviously has the industry advantage, where Canonical is working very, very closely with industry experts to make sure that their software is available as a Snap package. Flatpak has the repository uh, benefit, right? So one of the things that I, I have against Fla or, um, Snap Packs is that there is no concept of repositories. In fact, uh, SnapD has been hard-coded to use the proprietary Snap Store. So while all of the Snap, the Snap system itself is open source, the store in which software is pulled from, that's, a, that's controlled exclusively by Canonical. And so you'd have to go back and recode SnapD to look at a different software center. So it's, it's not like this. any of them are perfect. And again, going back to Flatpak, there is no concept of repository. Well, Flatpak has a concept of repository. SnapD doesn't. And so probably the most hands-off, universal, not controlled by any one company, not invented here syndrome, that whole thing, is probably App Image. And interestingly enough, I had a discussion, I've had a discussion with a number of different Linux nerds, especially over the last week. In fact, I was having a discussion with Michael and Ryan today. And I said, hey, you know, what do you think about some of this stuff? And they said, you know, App Image is really the commonly accepted best uh, version. If I have an application that I see as an App Image, that makes me very happy. I get very excited when something is released as an App Image. Of course, the downside of app images, there's really no update system built in. So you're essentially re-downloading a new app image every time you want an update. So each of these different systems has their own advantage and their own creative take on it. But there is no doubt that it is harder for Fedora users today 
to install a pack a snap package than it was previously. Now, this doesn't remove the ability to install a flat or a snap package altogether. You can still do it from the CLI. It's just removing that plugin inside of GNOME software. So that's an important distinction to make. You can still run snap packages on Fedora for now, as long as SnapD continues to run. But, and I'm quoting here, admittedly, this decision leaves a small, well, actually, that's a whole different thing. Uh, so it does not remove the ability for snap packages to run in Fedora, just the, the plugin. Now, <laughs> this quote really uh, exemplifies something I'm trying to get across here. Quote, admittedly, this decision leaves a small dent in Canonical's effort to promote snap as a cross distro at format. No, no, it does not. You removing the snap D plugin from GNOME Software Center does nothing to dent Canonical's effort to promote snaps as a cross-distro cross platform. First of all, it still is cross-distro platform. Second of all, even if it was removed entirely from Fedora and Red Hat, it would still be a cross-distro format because it's still possible to run the thing on Fedora and on Red Hat. You're just choosing not to. No, this decision leaves a small dent in Fedora's effort to have the software that Canonical has spent their money and their time working on with software companies to port to snaps. Good luck getting that same effort rolling with Flatpak because so far we haven't seen that effort. Now, who knows? I'd be the first person to say if tomorrow Red Hat dumps a bunch of money and they send a bunch of people out. Hey, you know what? The amount of people that they have working on GNOME and GNOME software, I'm sure they could with a snap of a fingers, especially now that they're owned by IBM, they have some pretty big checks to write. I'm sure with a snap of their fingers, they could begin to to exceed the groundwork and the momentum that Canonical has made with snap packages. But that hasn't happened yet. SnapD has the most success. Snap packages have the most success. Snap packages are probably the most well-known package format to people coming into Linux if you're looking at modern packaging formats. So you either choose to take, you either choose to participate in that success or you choose not to participate in that success. But I don't see how this falls back on Red Hat or, excuse me, I don't see how that falls back on Canonical either way. Now, Neil Gompa, he is a Fedora contributor. He is the main package maintainer that is responsible for SnapD on Fedora. He joins us on the Ask Noah show. Hey, Neil, welcome into the program. Hello, Noah. Nice to chat with you again. Yeah, good to have you back. So I guess let's start with this. Uh, I came across an article today, and obviously it references you uh, being rather surprised by this decision. Why did Fedora decide to remove the SnapD package from the uh, GNOME Software Center? So, the uh, first thing to kind of get straight here is that Fedora is not really a single entity uh, who makes these kinds of decisions. Um, there's, there's a number of people in various different groups and stuff like that. So, um, the main thing that happened here was uh, Richard Hughes, who is the uh, maintainer of GNOME software in Fedora, and as one of the principal developers and the creator of GNOME software in the GNOME project, um, he disabled the plugin in Fedora and originally had a merge request out on the GNOME GitLab to remove the plugin entirely upstream. Uh, this was precipitated uh, by something going on where he, uh, where it looked like Canonical wasn't shipping um, GNOME software anymore in Ubuntu in the in the upcoming releases, which I have no idea whether that's true or not. Uh, from what I could tell and from what people at Canonical had told me after finding out about this, they'd said that they intend to continue offering GNOME software in Ubuntu 19.10 and, and onward, so that was a confusing bit to me. But uh, because of that, because of what uh, of that particular tidbit, he had decided that uh, since nobody else really knows how the snap plugin works, and it's difficult to deal with bugs with it if there is no one around to maintain the plugin or really work on it, he went ahead and uh, disabled it for Fedora 31, uh, which is how this whole thing started. Does it strike you as strange timing? That well, I, I mean, so here's what I guess is a little confusing to me, or like what made me kind of look at the story sideways and go, "What?" So you have Ubuntu now shipping GNOME by default. Why wouldn't somebody from Canonical be maintaining the SnapD package in the in the GNOME Software Center? So the SnapD plugin is 
maintained by a member uh, uh, of uh, of Canonical, sorry, uh, an employee of Canonical, um, Robert Ansel, who wrote the plugin in the first place for GNOME Software and contributed there. And he maintains the bindings to SnapD that are used by GNOME Software, SnapD glib. And so that library uh, is maintained by him, as well as the plugin. However, um, from what I can tell, just looking at the uh, at the history of the in the GNOME software uh, Git commit history, the um, work being done in the upstream project had declined in terms of the snap plugin maintenance uh, over time. I'm not sure if it's because there was not much to do or if there was other things going on. I don't really have an answer for that. But basically, it looked like the amount of effort going into the Snap plugin was not equivalent to the amount of effort going into the Flatpak plugin for a while. And I suspect that maybe some discussions that had happened, uh, because there were some references to, to, in the GitLab merge request, there was references to some other discussions that they'd been having um, about what was going on. So, I mean, I, I don't know. what's What it looks like is... Um, there was, there was definitely maintenance. It was just not to the same extent that it was being done for the Flatpak plugin by Kalev Lember and uh, some of the other guys like at Endless and, and, other, and some of the other people who are actually using the Flatpak plugin. Do you get the impression that the Fedora community at large is committed to ensuring that Snap packages function well on Fedora, or is the view kind of, we have our own thing, flat packs are kind of what we're uh, centered towards. If somebody wants to come out and maintain it, hey, it's open source, you're welcome to do that. But as uh, you know, as the official Fedora stance, or maybe even the unofficial Fedora stance is, hey, if you want a universal package, use flat pack, not snap. Snap is really more of an Ubuntu thing. So, again, this is where it's hard to say that Fedora as a whole has an opinion one way or the other. It's certainly true that the Fedora project has placed a lot more energy on Flatpak than Snap. I mean, there's an order of magnitude more energy going into Flatpak right now. And that's because um, many of the, of the people working in the GNOME project are, dev, for obvious reasons, enthusiastic about Flatpak. And Fedora Workstation is, of course... Uh, a, a desktop environment that pr is a distribution that promotes the GNOME desktop and its technologies. And so a lot of the work that they've been doing in there is focused on that. Um, and for Fedora, be, uh, a lot of the um, stuff that's been going on for supporting, uh, uh, offering like Fedora flavored flat packs and stuff like that was largely because at least initially it didn't look like it was possible to support flat packs and snaps simultaneously. Like I had certainly explored doing it and I had been working on various attempts to try to get it so that we could produce Fedora based snaps and things like that. But initially it was very, uh, it was very cloudy how possible it would be. Over time this has cleared up and it's definitely much more possible now than it was in the past. But um, of course the momentum within the Fedora community, um, which uh, it is, you know, whatever it is, is uh, is ge geared, hmm, geared towards flat packs. And uh, from the snap side, uh, there's certainly work that I, uh, that a number of people are doing. Like I'm doing some work in there, as well as uh, a couple of other folks. Um, there's certainly plenty of users of snap, um, and there's definitely plenty of users of flat pack. I wouldn't say that Fedora as a project is producing a lot in terms of independent flat pack stuff right now that is certainly that's something that they're ramping up towards and i think we'll we'll see more of it from them but i'd also like to see us getting ramping up in terms of producing snaps as well and having those published so that high quality software that's within the fedora distribution is also available to other people who are using snap well, so, the, you know, it's interesting you bring that up. So we have spent a lot of time, probably, actually not probably, we have definitely spent a disproportional amount of time promoting and talking about snap packages over flat packs. And I guess the reason for that primarily, Neil, it, for, from my perspective, is because Canonical has done an excellent job of reaching out to people that have absolutely no interest in targeting Linux or very little interest in targeting Linux and saying, hey, here's a very easy, simple way, to the point that you and I attended a, 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 a not a conference, a, um, 
a small little meeting, I guess, I don't remember what the exact term was, but where they actually brought people in specifically to work on Snap packages um, and teach other companies, say, hey, if you want to develop for Linux, we'll sit you down next to our developers and show you how simple it is and show you how easy it is to make this package available on Linux. And so as a, a Linux-first guy and a distribution-specific guy second, I, I guess I look at that and go, wow, that would be really great to see Fedora and every, actually every distribution take advantage of that sort of communal work because I think that does benefit everybody. But I guess I'll ask you, Neil, how do flat packs, uh, how are flat packs superior to snap packages uh, as it relates to how they work on Fedora? Well, that's a tough question, but I guess the, the simple part is all the confinement features promised by Flatpak actually work in Fedora and not all of them do on for Snap yet. So we're in the we're in the beginnings of developing an SC Linux based backend for the Snap confinement mechanism, but for the longest time that hadn't existed, so we fell back to a much more limited confinement with set comp filters and using mountain namespaces and basic stuff like that. Similar things to what Flatpak does, but because Snap sandboxing can find around Ubuntu app armor, um, that is, is from the perspective of most snaps, it uh, looks like it's unconfined and it effectively may not be. Um, but the but one of the things that I had done personally to mitigate most of those problems was that I had written an SC Linux policy that not only sandboxed, or rather uh, locked down what snaps could access, but it also locked down the snap daemon itself. So snapd also had um, its permissions uh, locked down, um, which some Fedora people find to be, um, because, of how, because of how pervasive snapd is, it's not quite tuned completely. So you tend to see a lot of like uh, warnings from SC Linux um, things don't break, but you'll see a lot of warnings and, and some denials about certain things because I just flat out don't allow some things. Um, and yes, it doesn't look as nice, but at least it's working. So the conf there, is a, it, there is a confinement story. It's just a lot weaker in Fedora for snaps than it is for flat packs. For anybody that's trying to, to blow this out of proportion, I guess I'll, I'll just leave it here. The it's not, they're not preventing people from installing Snap. SnapD is, works just fine. It's just the plugin that ties Snap packages into the software center is what is being turned off by default. So you can still use Snaps on Fedora, assuming that they work correctly. Um, the change is just in that plugin. Do I understand that correctly? Yeah, so at this, at this moment right now, what it is is that the plugin just doesn't exist anymore in Fedora 31. Um, I'm hoping... That there, that we can, that um, we can come to uh, come to terms in a way that makes it so that we can restore the plugin and make it so that the experience is unbroken, going from Fedora 30 to Fedora 31. Um, and uh, I have confidence that the people who are involved in this will actually like come together and try to. Uh, make a, a compromise to to make this uh, something that we can that we can do. I mean, if all else fails, I have I have a fallback plan to restore the plugin. I don't want to have to use it if I don't have to because it's going to make a much more work for me personally and it's going to be difficult to keep up with. but like in the interest of of preserving a good user experience, I am willing to try to, go down that road for as long as I can, if I must. I'm just hoping I don't have to. Neil Gumpa, he is a Fedora contributor and a guest this hour on the Ask Noah Show. Hey, Neil, thanks so much for coming on the program again and sharing what is always an insightful experience. We'll get you back in the program soon. Yeah, yeah, I'm looking forward to it, Noah. Again, uh, phone lines are open, 855-450-NOAH. That's 855-450-6624, the email, live at Ask Noah Show. Dot com. I, I just I love the fact that this community has gotten to a place where I read, we read an article and the the people that are involved, the key people that are involved in the article are in the community and we can just reach out to them and say, hey, can you come on and talk to us about this thing? Speaking of people in the community reaching out and talking about a thing, Brett in Kansas City wrote to live at AskNoahShow.com and sent me in a link to a really awesome piece of software called BricsCAD. And uh, BricsCAD Shape, specifically, is a CAD system. It's a free 3D 
design software that's specifically geared towards architects and engineers. However, unlike many pieces of CAD software, this one claims to be easy enough to use even for regular users. They claim that it can be learned in 30 minutes or less. Now, they have tutorials on their site, which we'll have linked for you in the show notes over at podcast.asknoahshow.com. So you can check that out and you can take a look at their tutorial. Things that stood out to me. First of all, it most importantly, it is compatible with standard CAD format. So you have 25 plus years of people designing things on computers and they have centered around a couple of different standards. Do you know how Microsoft Office ate the lunch of Lotus Notes way back in the early 90s? The key thing that they did that allowed Microsoft Office to become the new standard in Office formats is a very simple technique, but it was very effective. They were backwards compatible with Lotus 1, 2, 3. And so if you had a Lotus spreadsheet, you could open it in Microsoft Excel, and then you were able to utilize uh, Microsoft Office. And then that one little choice to not do the not invented here system, but allow backwards compatibility fundamentally changed the, the trajectory of the Office suite. So the compatible formats are DWG, DXF, DWT and SKP. You can import any of those formats if you so choose to. Um, and that will allow you to, even if the, you have a design that was created by an architect or an architectural firm, you have the ability to open that in this piece of software. Now, when it comes to export, it's also fairly friendly. The software allows you to export in FBX, BMP, STL, or DAE. Also, you can save in DWG. Now, DWG stands out specifically because it is the format that is used by applications like DraftSite and AutoCAD. There are many other free CAD pieces of software like FreeCAD, LibreCAD. Um, I believe there's even uh, Tiega, which is a DMG viewer. So if you have a design that is sent to you, you're able to open that viewer and, 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 and view the design. This software allows you to be able to both open those pieces of software, save to those pieces of software, and import uh, those formats. It's designed for quick 3D mockups, buildings, and models, and not really geared towards very detailed design. So if you're designing a deck, this might be for you. If you're designing a rough layout of a new house that you want to go to, this design, this application may be for you. If you're designing a, you know, a, 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 a I don't know, a cathedral, uh, probably not want to do that in this software, really designed uh, more for light work. Now, 3D hardware acceleration is available on Linux, but it only works with NVIDIA and ATI cards paired with the latest proprietary drivers. So if you're looking for 3D hardware acceleration under Intel, for example, you're not going to find it. But I had a chance to download it. I am going to take some time and dig in and really learn this software. Uh, I say that because I have been searching for a long time for a good piece of software and haven't really found it for the ability to be able to design stuff. And so I would really like the uh, the ability to, I'm working on a deck right now and I would like to be able to design that. We're working on remodeling part of our house. I would like to be able to desi design that. And uh, I've never found a piece of CAD software that I could learn. And so even though this piece of software does seem to be proprietary, the fact that it works on Linux, the fact that it is compatible with all of these other pieces of software means that it earns a high place in my book and it's worth investing some time in because as, as I invest some time in and take a look at this stuff, and actually learn how to do it, then there's another skill that I have that I'm able to to leverage and and uh, kind of organize all of my the things that are in my head into actual computer drawings. 855-450-NOAH. That's 855-450-6624. You're on Ask Noah. Good afternoon. Good evening, Noah. This is Jim from Virginia. Hey, Jim. Welcome. I have a question about... Uh, accounting software that you might recommend for a small nonprofit organization. Mm -hmm. uh, I would, like, just general accounting stuff? Uh, well, if, if it has a bent towards nonprofits and uh, includes something of a payroll module, we don't have a lot of that, but there is some, that would be a big help. Um, the software that comes immediately to mind as it seems to check all of the boxes you've given me thus far is Invoice Ninja. Invoice Ninja is an open source piece of software that is available both as a software as a service. So you can just sign up for a monthly account and pay the fee 
and use the software, or you can pay a higher fee and they have a white label option where they'll still host it for you, but they will brand it whatever you like. Um, it's, it's a white label software, or you, of course, uh, because it's open source, can download the source code and host it yourself. And that will allow you to do all basic business functions um, where it's going to fall down a little bit. You talked a little bit about payroll. Obviously, when it comes to doing things like payroll, there are various different withholdings that have to be done. And there are obviously tie ins to things like direct deposit and stuff like that. If you're looking for those features to come with the accounting software, then Invoice Ninja is probably going to let you down. If you just want the accounting portion of it, you're going to handle those uh, those variables outside of your accounting software, then Invoice Ninja will work great, right? So for example, if you go to a third-party payroll service, or even if you calculate you know, the, the pay rate by hand or with some other program and just enter the actual financial details into Invoice Ninja, then Invoice Ninja is going to work very well for you. I see. Okay. So they're on the web as Invoice Ninja, or is there some cover company that... Uh that that has that as a product. Nope, that is actually it's it's invoice ninja. Yep, yeah. I, I I actually I think uh, I will have a uh, of course I'll have a link for you in the show notes at, at uh, podcast.asknoahshow.com, but their website is just invoice ninja dot com, and there you can find uh, all of the you know the pricing and and availability and the how to go about the process of uh, of hosting it yourself. Interestingly enough, their their bottom tier is uh, free. It it costs nothing. It's limited to a hundred clients. Um, but you have unlimited invoices and unlimited quotes, uh, and then they they have a breakdown of all of their features from there. Obviously, you go up. You know, even the pro plan is only eight bucks a month, and that gives you unlimited clients and unlimited invoices and quotes. And then their enterprise plan, which is their highest one, um, you know, gives you more features. Yet that again has the option to white label. Uh, it's twelve bucks per month per user. So I mean, it, it, the pricing is not bad, and like I say, then if you if you don't like that, you can go ahead and host it. You get all the features for yourself, and uh, and because it's open source, you're not locked into anything. So absolutely great product. I, I really really like it. Um, I I will mention just for the sake of completeness, QuickBooks Online. Even though Intuit is a terrible company, whom I dislike strongly, their business practices leave much to be desired, and their moral compass is so screwed up they'd have a hard time finding their way to the parking lot back to their cars. All that aside. It's not bad. It's not a bad piece of software. And the, the thing that is great about QuickBooks is it ties into everything. So you want payroll, they have that as an option. You want tax preparation, they have that as an option. You get audited by the IRS, well, guess what? They have an expedited way for you to hand them your QuickBooks file so they can go about the process of getting you to pay more money to the government more expediently. I mean, it depends on what you're looking for, but I, I, I can't, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't at least mention the fact that QuickBooks Online is a, is a product that works on Linux perfectly and has a very low resistance if you're a small business owner trying to get up and running and you need the product to work and you need it to stay out of your way. The licensing isn't ideal and the company is, I mean, saying the company isn't ideal is is putting it lightly. All right. Well, I thank you very much for your input. I thank you very much for the call. 855-450-NOAH. That's 855-450-6624. Again, the email live at asknoahshow.com. Uh, <laughs> Dropbox has released the beta build 77-3-127 and they have made some improvements specifically to people that are using it on Linux. Now, I just got done talking uh, to a gentleman where I told him to pay attention to self-hosting and not get vendor lock-in and stuff like that. So I stand by all of that. That said, for all of the bad things that we say about Dropbox, A, a lot of people still use Dropbox in production. A lot of Linux companies that are very much dedicated to Linux, specifically Linux on the desktop, use it every day as their main storage for their business because it's a cost-effective way to store data if you're not terribly concerned about uh, privacy. I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, I would have no problem whatsoever storing Ask Noah Show stuff on Dropbox. Why? Because I intend it to be published anyway. I could care less if some, if some Dropbox employee wants to go into my account and take the latest episode of Ask Noah, all they're doing is saving me the trouble of having to pay for the bandwidth for them to download it off of our site. I lose the metrics, but I, I, I am more than happy for people to take show content out of Dropbox if they want to steal it for me. Knock yourself out. So there are some situations in which it doesn't make sense to care about privacy because the content or the data or whatever is intended for public consumption anyway. Open source companies, again, dedicated to Linux, use it as their main business storage. So there, there is a good argument to be made that 
it fits in perfectly with a Linux advocate and somebody who uses Linux on a day-to-day -day basis in production. The other thing you get, name recognition. Everybody has heard of Dropbox. And so when you say you want to share a file with Dropbox, people are more inclined to just click on the link because they're familiar with Dropbox. If they have their own Dropbox account, there's obviously internal ways to share access to files and, and so on and so forth. Obviously, because they're a large company and it's spread up over a large CDN, downloading files and uploading files, very, very quick, very, very easy. And you also have the social network effect, right? Everybody starts to put their stuff on Dropbox and everybody can share with everybody else because we're all in the same system. And I'd be remiss again if I didn't mention, albeit begrudgingly, they have had steady support for Linux. For years and years and years, for as long as I've been, if for as long as I've been forced to use Dropbox by one client or the other, there has always been support for Linux. I've never felt like a second class citizen using Dropbox on Linux, but it's getting even better because now they support ZFS on 64 bit systems. They support EcryptFS, which if you haven't familiar with, if you're not familiar with EcryptFS, I, as a KDE user, uh, one of the things that comes installed by default on KDE is KDE vaults. And I, at first I was a little, uh, I was a little confused because I didn't really know what, uh, what uh, KDE Vault was, but then I found that you can use CryFS, you can use uh, EncryptFS, or you can use Ecrypt. I think e uh, I think those are the same thing. EcryptFS. Yeah, I think those are the same thing. But anyway, point is, uh, th there is there is support built into this right into KDE, so you can create easily containers, file containers that that store encrypted files, which is remarkable and it's really cool and it's a way for people to approach encryption very easily if you're on uh, if you're on. KDE. So the fact that Dropbox is now willing to support this is really fantastic. They also support ButterFS if for some stupid reason you decide that you don't care about your data and so you're going to store it on ButterFS. But uh, this is really cool. So Dropbox has continued to iterate on Linux and they continue to bring support back for modern file systems in the way that Linux users want to store their data. I think that's great. It also means that if I, I would imagine you could set it up in such a way in which you could sync your encrypted file vault up to Dropbox and have it encrypted locally so Dropbox themselves don't have access to it. I've not tried it, but my understanding the way Dropbox works is it does sync a delta, so you're not moving the entire file every single time. If you can sync the delta between the previous encrypted vault and the after encrypted vault, in theory, Dropbox doesn't have access to your data. You retain access to your data on any machine that you have the encryption key for. That should work out pretty nicely. And their plans, frankly, they're reasonable enough. They start at $12.50 a month. That gets you three terabytes. Now, that is a great deal if you have priced out storage space. I think if you went over to DigitalOcean and tried to host your own server with three terabytes of storage, you're looking at 300 some bucks a month. And so the only real way to do that is the way that we've done it at Delta Speed Technologies, which is we actually purchase a server. We pay a company to colo it for us in one of our data centers, and then we sell access uh, to individualized instances of C file or our uh, community instance of C file. By the way, if you're looking for hosting, Altaspeed Technologies offers that. You can go to, over to altaspeed.com or call customer care at 866-280-1433 and say that you're interested in C-File. That's a service that we offer. If you're in Dropbox, the only thing I have to tell you is just keep in mind, they for a long time it's been known that Dropbox uses a single encryption key and employees have access to said encryption key, so your data is really not safe if you're trying to keep Dropbox employees from accessing it. Won't let other people access it unless they pay enough money to Dropbox employees, which have access to it. But if you host it yourself, at even at twelve fifty a user, it doesn't take long to hit a few hundred bucks, which is what you could call a server for. And uh, and of course, there you can you can go from three terabytes or six terabytes to like tens of terabytes. So it's a way way better deal, uh, way better return on investment. Feedback section is the place where we answer your questions. You can write in at live at asknoahshow.com. We'd love to take your feedback and read it here on the air. Graham A. writes in and says, Hello, I deal with quite a few servers, mostly a hobbyist. I mostly have a habit of tinkering and trying stuff out, and I want some way to log how I've set things up and worked around bugs so when I come back to a device, I can have some way of knowing what I was up to and any info. Passwords aren't the main issue as I use Bitwarden, but the company I work for has a proprietary application that they use to track everything about all of their servers. It's a beast. I do like the idea of centrally logging all of my server details. Is a wiki my best option? I currently run GitLab and have started to use, have started using issues and the wiki to track things, but I'm wondering if there's a better way. Sincerely, Graham. Well, 
there is a there's a couple of ways to go about that process. Uh, first of all, what you're trying to do is absolutely a thing that you should be doing. As a person who sets servers up for a living, as a person who sets a bunch of infrastructure up for a living, I couldn't tell you what I did, what I ate for breakfast this morning, much less what the what the gotchas were and how we went about fixing them from a week and a half ago. Okay, never mind five years ago, the stuff we've done. So documentation is absolutely key. In fact, I tell my employees documentation is more important than the actual work itself. In fact, much to their chagrin sometimes, I, I get on their case and I approach documentation as a newbie. It drives the people that work for me nuts because they know I'm not an idiot, right? I host a show about Linux. I talk about Linux. I tell other people how to use Linux. And then they send me documentation for something like, well, let's go ahead and set this particular server up. And this, the, the server has like big concept ideas rather than specific line by line commands. And I'm like, well, how do I do this? How do I do that? Like, really? Really? You don't know how to W get a file? I'm like, yes, I know how to W get a file. I want the W, com the w get command in its entirety on a line so that in the heat of the moment, when I'm trying to troubleshoot something, I don't want to have to think about it. I want monkey see, monkey do. Here's the, here's the commands we entered last time. Here's the commands we entered this time. It is, uh, by the way, I will tell you, as far as composing your documentation, we'll get to where to store it in a second. As far as composing your documentation, I highly recommend exporting your bash history. One of the first things I'll do when I set up a server, anytime I complete setting up a server or setting up a service, the very first thing I do, export the bash history, destroy the server, start a new server up, do it all over again. And that second time around is what allows me to go through and say, okay, that thing, that package I installed, that wasn't needed. This thing is needed. And then if I have to make any changes to the file the second time around, we do it a third time and a fourth time and as many times as needed until I can follow my guide from top to bottom and everything works flawlessly. I find that somewhat amusing because a lot of those guides, I will turn into public guides and, and feature them here on the show. And I've had people that write into me, particularly about the YubiKey guide and say, it doesn't work on Linux. Yes, it does. I do it five times a day. Trust me, it works exactly the way I said it works. If you follow the guide, if you start from the top and go to the bottom on how to set up a YubiKey, it will 100% work on Linux. I We buy YubiKeys all the time, and I set them up four or five times, maybe not a day, but certainly a month. Uh, and it it works flawlessly if you follow the guide from start. Monkey see, monkey do. You could turn it into a script if you wanted to. That's how accurate those instructions are. And so you're right to go about the process of documenting what you're doing. Now, as far as what to use, I use OS Ticket, and I recommend that you do too, and here's why. A wiki is not designed with any security involved. And what's going to happen is if you don't have any security uh, involved, you're going to start leaving out instructions because it contains a particular file or a particular password or it contains some sort of confidential secret information that you're afraid uh, a wiki, and you'd be right, isn't really designed to protect. And especially if it's running out on, on a server that's, you know, if you're running something like, uh, I don't know, whatever software you want to use, it's more or less designed for public consumption. OS Ticket is specifically designed with two modes, internal and public. If something is internal, you're the only person that's going to be able to get to it. If it's public, anybody's going to be able to get to it. And so you also have the ability, if you do set something up and it's not supposed to be private or doesn't need to be private, you have the opportunity to share that link with other people. So for those reasons, I recommend that you use uh, OS Ticket. If I wasn't going to use OS Ticket, my very close second contender would be... Um, Cody MD because it supports Markdown, so it's easy to, to drum up a guide. It's it's uh, web accessible. It does support authentication. It's light. It's easy to set up. So that would be my second choice. And then my third choice would be set up a C file server and write your documentation out in Sublime Text and uh, sync them up to your C file server so you have a, uh, a copy of them. And in fact, interestingly enough, all of the emergency documentation for AltaSpeed Technologies, that is to say, if any of our servers go down, I have emergency guides for every server that we manage and every server that we have into production. And if something really bad happens, uh, all of those are in plain text files that are encrypted locally on my computer and synced up to, to C files. So I can get the, to those files from anywhere as long as I have the encryption key. And of course, we back those up into not one, not two, but three separate locations. So there's basically no way I'm going to lose access to that data. Hey, have you guys heard about Linux Delta? LinuxDelta.com is a new place for the community to come together to learn and express their opinions about Linux. You can leave a review for a Linux distro or you can research Linux distros. Now, 
we're at a weird point because we're at the point where we have the basic site done, but there's a ton of modifications and a ton of suggestions that have come in. And what we're trying to figure out is how we're going to go about the process of continuing to fund and build the site, because obviously developers need to be paid for their time. And what I've done in the past is I've just tucked the things that I've done in the open source community under the UltaSpeed umbrella. Now, my accountants hate that because they look at it and they go, why are we spending thousands of dollars on the year on this Ask Noah show thing? I'm like, well, because I need to travel and I need to be able to put on a show and I need to be able to film interviews and stuff like that. And you know, and frankly, I, you know, we had a very frank discussion and I just said, listen, I work 18 hours a day. I earn the money. You figure out how I can spend it legally on this thing. And so that's the, that's the, uh, that's the emergency plan with Linux Delta. If we can't find another way to fund it, that's what I'll do. I'll just tuck it under and, and we'll continue to, to, to move forward and make progress. But I think it speaks a little bit to, uh, the community's value of a given product. If we can fund that inside of the community and not rely on a business, even if it is my own business, to take over that. So if you guys have suggestions on the best way to fund LinuxDelta.com, let me know. Uh, we obviously want to create a way for people to search and research distros in a different way to display those. Kind of thinking about Patreon, kind of thinking about things like Subscribestar, but I'm not sure what the best way to go. I'd be interested in your feedback. Again, send that to live at AskNoahShow.com. Hey guys, that's it for this episode. Did you know the Ask Noah Show? You can find all of the articles and references that we talk about on the show at podcast.asknoahshow. Huge thanks to Sarah, our call screener, JTR producer. We'll see you next week, 6 p.m. Central, asknoahshow.com. Asknoahshow.com.